And thank you for the great introduction. Um, welcome all. Sorry, I didn't get a break, but we'll, um, we've got some wonderful panelists here, and um, it's uh, just a privilege to be introducing them. Now, this panel is called uh, NCAA Enforcement Sanctions and Relationships with Universities, and I think I was picked to moderate it because for, I got to know all those things for my years is on the athletic board of the University of Georgia when I was uh, a faculty member at that school. And um, so I'm looking forward very much to what these people are saying. Our format's a little different for this panel. We have two speakers who are making presentations, giving papers, um, and I will introduce them first. They'll have a little longer um, than the others. And then, we'll go, then I will get back up and introduce the three panelists who will each have a time to both respond and make any comments of their own. Um, and then we want to open it to you. We want to, we're trying very hard to save a half an hour. So please, um, there, there are cards around, um, um, prepare questions. Let me introduce our two main speakers though. I don't want to take any longer. Um, first, Rod Smith. I've gotten to know both of these over, over lunch. Two, two great, great speakers. We're so happy to have them. He's a distinguished pre professor of law and director of the Center of Sports Law and Policy at Thomas Jefferson Law School down in San Diego. Now, he's also co-authored uh, three of the leading uh, textbooks that people use when studying sports law. So some of you may know him from his textbooks. He's also published ex extensively in sports law and policy areas, largely emphasizing the role of the NCAA in regulating intercollegiate athletics. I know he has a separate specialty in church and state relations. I've read some of his books and articles in that field. Um, I'll also add that I think he's been a dean of about half the law schools in America and um, uh, served as president of the Southern Virginia University. So he, uh, like some of our early er, speakers, uh, knows this from uh, various sides. Um, the other speaker, and he'll just get up as soon as uh, uh, Rod Smith is done, is uh, Matt Mitten. Now, um, the other best person we could have on this topic and, and um, uh, Maureen, thank you for putting these people together. Um, he's a professor of law and director of National Sports uh, Law Center and the LLM program in sports law um, and program for foreign lawyers at Marquette University Law School, which attracts law students from around the country to study sports law. He has also authored textbooks in this field and is a member of the Court of Arbitration for Sport and serves as a Sports Lawyers Association's Board of Directors. Um, I could go on and on with his other activities, both in sports law and in um, um, academics in general, but because you're short on time, let me turn it over to Professor Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Ed, and uh, you're right. My mother wondered, as I went from deanship to deanship, if I ever really would be able to hold a job. <laughs> so it is good to be here. Thanks so much for the wonderful hospitality that's been extended by the law review and everyone associated with the university. And I'm even more grateful that you're taking on, or maybe I should say tackling, the issues that are being dealt with today. Mine really has to do with head injuries, student welfare, and college football. Concussions constitute 7.4% of the injuries suffered by college football players. An additional 4.3% of the injuries are head, neck, and face injuries. And yet that is only the tip of the iceberg. None of those injuries yet count for, account for the chronic traumatic encephalopathy that will happen later in life, CTE, that you're hearing about in the NFL lawsuits and so forth. It is conceivable that as many as one out of five college football players may suffer CTE, which leads to dementia, brain impairment, relatively early in life, and yet it's latent. It can take as many as 20 or 30 years for that to appear. The uh, President Obama, recognizing this problem, said, I quote, you read some of these stories about college players who undergo some of these problems with concussions and so forth and then have nothing to fall back on. That's something I'd like the NCAA to think about, end quote. 
He could have picked on it. He did talk about the NFL. But in the NFL, he recognizes the NFL, these are highly paid workers in a high risk industry. That's understandable. That's not true in the NCAA, where under Article I of the NCAA, it's a commitment to amateurism and the non commercialism. And then Article II of the NCAA Constitution focuses on student welfare, student health, student safety, the relationship of trust between students and coaches. So it is a different world. And I think the President was right to say to the NCAA, you need to think about this. And when the President says that, he means you need to do something about it after thinking about it. None of this is new. In, uh, 1904, President Roosevelt, after 18 deaths occurred in college football, said, enough. He called the leaders of colleges and universities together and said, you need to do something about it. The New York Times had just reported that college football, as it was being played in the United States, was, quote, murder and mayhem, end quote. So they, they got together and ultimately formed an organization and so forth asked to do that in 1904, and in typical fashion, in 1916, over a decade later, they come up with a rule book having to do with uh, football, college football, and the NCAA is born. And then it's another 23 years until 1939 that they decide maybe, given all of the evidence that appeared beginning in a, re with a report in the American Medical Association in 1928 of recurrent head injuries, that maybe we should require helmets. So in 1939, the NCAA required that student athletes wear helmets. Then in 1994, after they'd had more than a decade of dramatic increases year after year in head injuries and concussions, the NCAA said, or put forth in 1994, a set of guidelines. <coughs> then in the year 2010, all these things happen in decades, in 2010, they say you're going to need concussion management plans. But there is no enforceability, no teeth to this. In effect, the NCAA has washed its hands saying, no, the members will take care of that. That's their responsibility. Here's the problem. It's not working, and it won't. And I use two examples in my paper, one of Taylor Lewin, a store at the University of Michigan, another of the Arizona quarterback who comes out of the game vomiting, having clearly had a head injury. No concussion management plan is placed. He's sent back onto the field by the player. What about Taylor Lewin? Twelfth game of the season. He's hurting all over. My guess is particularly in the head. My guess is he's taking multiple ibuprofen every day for his head, for what he's suffering. And his players tell him, shut up, Taylor, and go out and play. We play through injuries. That's what we do. And his coach praised him for his courage. And then he did the same thing again in 2012. The schools aren't going to deal with this problem. The NCAA has to. And my paper is a game plan for what the NCAA ought to do. If they don't, someone will do it for them. Again, the NCAA has a track record as a slow responder. But here's what they ought to do. They need to work in three areas, safety and scheduling, enforcement, and compensation. Safety and scheduling, as to safety rules, I would defer to the NCAA, get data, assess that data, determine what you can do to improve safety. A couple areas they ought to look at. Number one is, uh, would be having, uh, doing something with special teams. And probably the most significant would be something to do with scheduling, having fewer games. Amherst played eight games last year at the Division III level. And they're Division I teams that play 14 games. You could clearly cut down the, what the, what uh, CTE is, is this repeated subconcussive acts on the head. That's what we really ought to be worried about. Fewer games, fewer practices, shorter seasons would do something about that. 
The second area is enforcement. The NCAA needs to enforce the concussion management plans and protocols. The coaches are the culprits. They are the people who send the players out again as they did at Arizona in a critical game so that they can make the difference. And does it change, does it give them a competitive advantage? It surely does. So there is every reason for the NCAA to begin to enforce student safety, Article II of the Constitution, as vigorously, as strictly as under the new rules, they're going to enforce uh, rules with regard to recruiting. They need to take care of the players, fulfill that trust. What should they do? I think these are level one and level two offenses. If a, if a coach sends a player back out without putting them through the protocols, or if a coach tries to put pressure on a medical professional to send them out, they have a major violation, and they should be held accountable for it. What does that mean? I was on the Infractions Appeals Committee, wrote the opinion in the Haskins case where we gave him a seven-year order to show cause. That ended his career. That's what needs to be done because we have this culture of playing through injuries and we need to do something about that and that will not be done at the institutional level. The personnel also need to be accountable. If you're at a place like the University of Michigan and you understand your coach is praising players for playing through injuries, you may have a problem that you ought to look into. And if you don't, you should be held accountable. Also, players who fake baselines or engaged in other behavior to get back on the field prematurely when they're suffering injury should be subjected to enforcement. We have to do that to overcome the culture. So that's my second and my third tier is the one that's even more controversial and that's providing some form of workers' compensation. It's going to happen regardless. I don't know whether the Arrington, Arrington case will succeed against the NCAA. I know one will someday. The one that in my view is most likely, as I tell my students, is under SB 1525, the Athlete Bill of Rights in California. They are now treating at the four major universities in this state student athletes as if they're employees. If that's true, then under the liberal California workers' compensation law, you're going to see workers' compensation suits brought on behalf of former players at this BCS, uh, the federal uh, or the level, uh, the top uh, teams. I think the NCAA can fund it. Where's the fund? We just heard about a 400% increase in the funds for the showing the national championship. If you took just half of that increase and put it into a trust, you'd have all of the funds you needed. You'd have $150 million that you could use to begin to form a trust that we could keep the trust that we owe these players who I can tell you 20 years from now are going to come back with CTE. We need to keep our promise to them in that regard. A word about, but what about non-Division I players? Enforcement will help them. Safety rules will help them. We need to have more disclosure so that before a person goes and plays, they understand the risks that they're under. There are a lot of things that can be done shorter seasons as uh, well. Now, is the BCS likely to yield up these funds? No. So it may be that we need congressional hearings, both to spur the NCAA along. They are not, they are, as I said earlier, a slow responder. But they will respond as the NFL has to pressure. So you could have congressional hearings. But if the, NA, if the NCAA would come forward with an enforcement package, a safety package, and a compensation package, I think, going back to the last panel, they should then be given a waiver for antitrust purposes, and we should regain control of the BCS. 
The BCS taking over football has really commercialized it. Their whole reason for being is to maximize profits. It is not as the NCAA for student welfare and for uh, amateurism, non-commercialism, the very things we heard about in the first panel. In my, in, in conclusion, because I want to save time for questions, and my paper's 50 pages long and there's data and there's all kinds of information. I was really struck by something that uh, Ken Starr said this morning. He said, if you're mistreating your players, it's going to come out. Well, we're mistreating the players. 7.4% with concussions, we're sending them back on the field. The evidence for the mounting evidence that there will be serious CTE and other injuries is there. It's going to come out. This is a time for the NCAA to be proactive. Have they ever been proactive? Yes. Contrary to most people, I supported the Penn State decision, the consent decree. In that case, the welfare of individuals had been implicated by a major university who wanted to maintain their competitive advantage by hiding those facts. And the NCA acted appropriately. It is time for them to act in that manner and be proactive instead of reactive so that we can care for the student athletes. Okay, um, my topic, which kind of ties right in with what Rod was saying, although I have a bit of a different view than his, is on the uh, disciplinary action that the NCAA took against uh, Penn State. And if you look at the title, there's really, I think, four things to focus on. One, unprecedented. Uh, two, coercive means. Uh, three, certainly laudable ends. Uh, and then fourth, the question, is there a legal remedy? And I'll just run through rather quickly a chronology of some of the events, because I think it's important to see just how fast moving um, this was. Uh, in November of, uh, November 5th, 2011, uh, Jerry Sandusky, Penn State's former football coach, uh, was indicted and arrested for basically serial uh, sexual child abuse. Um, very soon thereafter, uh, a Penn State vice president and their athletic director were charged with fair to report child abuse and perjury and they were placed on administrative leave. Um, two days thereafter, uh, President Graham Spanier had been there for a number of years and Joe Paterno, who'd been there seemingly forever, uh, they were both fired. Uh, and then as President Starr mentioned this morning, uh, Spanier was indicted. Uh, and that's also subject to a um, pending proceeding. Um, very soon thereafter, uh, the NCAA came calling. Uh, President uh, Emmert sent a letter, and among other things, it said the following. It said, the NCAA will examine Penn State's exercise of institutional control over its athletics um, program. Uh, and then went on and listed uh, some potential underlying violations. And if you look at all of these things here, character, integrity, civility obligations, unethical conduct, honesty, sportsmanship, positive moral values, really, it, it's hard to identify a specific rule that what did not happen at Penn State uh, violated, but it was just more of this violates NCAA uh, principles and values. And one thing that I think was significant is there was no notice at all in this letter, and I don't think at any other time, that there was gonna be potentially the use of a non-traditional disciplinary process, which we'll talk about in a minute, the normal uh, Committee on Infractions uh, process. So, again, this is moving very quick. Uh, the Penn State Board commissions the free investigation, uh, which I'm sure everyone's heard about. Um, a couple months later, Joe Paterno dies of lung cancer. And then finally on June 22nd of 2012, uh, Sandusky's convicted of 45 counts of sexual abuse of children. 
many of which occurred on the Penn State campus. I think there were at least eight or nine. So this really is uh, an unbelievable situation. Um, one thing, Jerry Sandusky retired as football coach. He'd been there a number of years before the 1999 season. So he hadn't been the football coach since that period. Uh, and what's really surprising here is that they gave him continued access to the campus. We'll go on um, a few minutes. So the free report comes out um, very soon thereafter, after Sandusky's conviction. And uh, one of its key findings, a total and consistent disregard by the most senior leaders at Penn State for the safety and welfare of Sandusky's child victims. Um, there had been uh, a criminal investigation in May of 1998 while Jerry Sandusky was still coach. A mother of an 11-year-old boy had said, hey, he took him into the shower. There was inappropriate touching. There was a criminal investigation, but no charges um, were filed. So Penn State's on notice as, you know, what, what's going on here. He steps down as football coach in 19, uh, before the 1999 season, and the free report finds there isn't any correlation between uh, this incident and him stepping down. He'd apparently been told he was not going to be the um, Joe Paterno's successor, and then he uh, has basically made a coach emeritus. I think he was a emeritus professor in the um, phys ed department. And then another key finding here, to avoid the consequences of bad publicity, the most powerful leaders of the university, so you have the president, vice president who's responsible for athletics, athletic director and coach Paterno, repeatedly concealed critical facts uh, relating to this child abuse from the authorities, board of trustees, Penn State community, and the public um, at large. A couple other uh, key things. Uh, the free report found a lack of centralized control over the university's athletic department and noted that for the past several decades that it was permitted to become a closed um, community. And then it recommended a number of steps to ensure sustained integration of intercollegiate athletic department into the broader Penn State community and of course to improve its governance and to protect children in its facilities and programs. One of the things that struck me in reading the free report is it seemed like there was a very antiquated organizational structure at Penn State. Um, it's a very large university and the free report noted they did not even have an inside general counsel until about 2006 or 2007. Uh, I think that's one of the things that was really problematic. I mean, I think it illustrates there wasn't any uh, general counsel's office in-house. Well, maybe we would have had a little bit different treatment if that was the case. I don't know for sure, but uh, that really uh, struck me. Okay, so what um, happens right after this, and notice how quickly after the free report comes out. There are what I put here, quote, negotiations between the NCAA uh, and Penn State. And what happened was that the NCAA's executive committee, uh, the Division I Board of Directors and President Emmert accepted the free report. And then what happened is there was notification that um, there wasn't going to be any following of the traditional process of going through the Committee on Infractions. Uh, Gene Marsh, who was a former um, member of that, uh, the Committee on Infractions for a number of years, the uh, chair of it for a period of time, uh, he was hired by Penn State to represent and advise them. And he characterized this as the NCAA equivalent of a cram down. And of course, there wasn't this process. And this is, you know, it was a little bit surprising to me. It eventually comes out in the media that Penn State was threatened with a four-year shutdown of its football program. Um, if, you know, that was the threat initially, and they said, this is the process we're going to go through. And they were told that if any of these, quote, negotiations are leaked to the media, then it's very likely that this death penalty would be imposed. So. Eventually, it leads to a consent decree. Again, just a couple days um, later, that comes out. It's interesting that it is captioned as a consent decree. Typically, that's something you know, more commonly used. Consent decree settles 
um, you know, pending litigation, but I guess, you know, we have an agreement, consent decree, and it provides uh, the following, that Penn State accepted the free report findings and acknowledged that its findings um, established its violation of the NCAA principles and rules that were cited in uh, President Emmert's letter. Now, there's some real question here, what I've seen from media accounts, as to whether, you know, it didn't look like the entire Penn State board was fully informed of what was going on. I mean, this is clearly something that they should have been. This really had an impact on the university. Um, and it was really some doubt as to whether, at this particular point in time, the board actually accepted um, these findings here. The consent decree states that the traditional investigative and administrative proceedings would be duplicative and unnecessary. You know, that, the, the thought was that, well, you know, the free report is very thorough. If the university has accepted these findings, uh, no need to go through the traditional process. And Penn State was required to waive its rights to a determination of any violations by the infractions committee, any appeal under NCAA rules, or any judicial process. So you can see why uh, Gene Marsh characterized this as the equivalent of a cram down, which is typically what happens in bankruptcy. So let's look at some of the provisions. Um, very severe, a $60 million fine payable over five years. This was calculated, uh, it was roughly equivalent to the revenues that the football program uh, generated in a given year, and that will go to organizations uh, to combat uh, child abuse. A four-year postseason football ban. So the school was permitted to play football during uh, its regular season games, but not eligible for bowl games. The Big Ten also imposed the penalty. They were not eligible uh, to play in the Big Ten championship if they would have otherwise qualified. Um, a four-year scholarship reduction in the football program. Uh, can award no more than 15 scholarships in a given year. Uh, the typical maximum is 25, and a 65 uh, number maximum. Ordinarily, I think it is um, 85. There were also 112 football wins that Penn State was required to vacate from 1998 to 2011. And the rationale for that was that this was when the university first, uh, at least, should have had some knowledge of what was going on and didn't take the appropriate action. And then five years probation, and then we talked about the required to adopt the free report recommendations, and then they were required to enter into an athletics integrity agreement with an independent monitor. Uh, no individuals were disciplined. Um, the thought, because of these pending prosecutions of the university president, vice president, athletic director. They did not want to uh, impose any discipline on them. Uh, but I think it's fair to say uh, Joe Paterno effectively was disciplined uh, you know, after his death because of taking away the wins, no longer uh, you know, won more football games um, than anyone else. So um, now here's where I, I think it's kind of interesting. And I had actually taped the NCAA press conference and went back and um, looked at this. So here's what, um, this was uh, Dr. Edward Ray, and he was the uh, chair of the executive committee. And he said these are extraordinary circumstances and that the NCAA executive committee has the authority to act on behalf of the entire association in extraordinary circumstances and that they had chosen to exercise this authority. And I had to do a little bit of digging to figure out, well, what exactly, what was the source of that authority? Uh, and here it was. This was in a um, press release that the NCAA about this time. And it's uh, this bylaw 4.1.2e, and it says executive committee is authorized, quote, to act on behalf of the association by adopting and implementing policies to resolve core issues and other association-wide matters. So you look at that and it's like, well, that's interesting. Um, you know, adopting and implementing policies. And again, there is a well-established enforcement process in place that the executive committee uh, believed was not appropriate to go through, that this was the way um, to resolve 
um, this matter. A couple other things that came out of the press conference. President Emmert stated, um, he said, well, I was basically working with the executive committee. We're working together to correct what was a horrifically egregious situation in intercollegiate athletics, which I think we can all uh, agree on that. You know, just no, uh, no excuse for this. When the university uh, knew or should have known what was going on, how can you continue to give someone access to campus university facilities where you have uh, conduct like this going on? And here's what I think is, is really crucial here is, you know, you raise the question of why didn't they go through the typical enforcement process? And I think this is really the, the key reason here. Um, in, in response to a question, um, Dr. Ray said, we have to reassert our responsibilities in charge to oversee intercollegiate athletics. And when he says we, he was speaking of presidents and chancellors. And he made it very clear that the message here is that presidents and chancellors are in charge. And I think this followed closely on some other um, widely reported scandals uh, involving football. USC, Ohio State, uh, University of North Carolina, some allegations of uh, academic fraud, uh, and then Miami. So this is the context in which this is all occurring. So let's take a look at um, some of the institutional liability of, of Penn State and the cost. Uh, looks like this is pretty clearly a violation of the Cleary Act, which is a federal law that requires reporting, warning of on-campus crimes, as well as Pennsylvania law, which requires reporting of child abuse. Um, certainly, potentially huge tort liability for inadequately protecting children who were coming on to the Penn State campus involved in Penn State activities. Apparently, one of these assaults occurred. Uh, Jerry Sandusky was taking children from his second mile program, traveling with them to bowl games, and they were staying in his hotel room. So. I mean, there's no question that access was provided that shouldn't have been. Um, you know, at one point, uh, Penn State, one of the top five most trusted uh, NCAA properties, uh, look how quickly it fell down to last. Um, and then they've incurred 41 million in costs through December of last year. I think now it's up to 46 or 47 million. Um, so here's kind of the heart of things, and I'll go through this rather quickly. Um, you know, one of the things I think to ask is were Penn State, was uh, Penn State's contractual procedural rights violated? NCAA really has four primary objectives, uh, maintaining competitive balance, academic integrity, amateurism, student athlete welfare. Um, they set forth what's the process of enforcement, uh, eliminate violations of the rules, take appropriate action, but committed to fairness of procedures, uh, very well established. Um, process here, committee on infractions, engage in fact findings, determine rules violations, impose sanctions, and then the university has a right of appeal to the infractions appeals committee. I think this is a, you know, it's, it's a form of a private legal system with procedural rights and reliance upon, I think, a develop, what a lot of people would consider as precedent uh, that has resulted in fairness and consistency for the most part, um, but that process was bypassed. One question is, does the NCAA, did they really have jurisdiction to discipline um, Penn State? Um, the consent decree comes right out and says, well, ordinarily sexual abuse of children on a university campus by a former official ordinarily would not be actionable. But here, this was so unprecedented, you know, found to be such a failure of institutional integrity. And this is a little bit, I, I'm not sure that um, th this is, that the findings of the free report necessarily support this conclusion that the fear or deference to the omnipotent football program enabled the sexual predator to attract and abuse his victims. That's why I think it was so important that Penn State would have had an opportunity to be heard. Yes, maybe not necessary to, for the NCAA to conduct a full-blown investigation, just rely upon the free report, but give the university and the officials an opportunity to be heard. What I think we really have here is an exercise of de facto best interest power uh, to discipline for misconduct contrary to the values of higher education and principles of intercollegiate athletics. Nothing necessarily wrong with that, but um, there's not only contractual issues here, 
but there's a law of private associations which basically requires uh, private associations like the NCAA, which have vast nationwide monolithic authority to do a number of things. One, comply with its own rules. Two, provide fair notice of violations and due process in disciplinary proceedings. The only thing that I think comes close the Penn State situation was what happened in Baylor a number of years ago where one player killed another and there was a cover-up that the basketball coach was involved with. That went through the infractions committee and got resolved. Um, again, I don't see why that couldn't have happened here. Um, third, you're required to is exercise disciplinary authority rationally and consistently without any malice or bad faith. I don't think there was malice or bad faith here. I think the executive committee and others were trying to do what they thought was best. And then finally, you have to comply with applicable public laws, which would include antitrust law, not federal constitutional law, because the NCAA is not a state actor. So I'm running out of time, so I'll go through quickly here. Um, one of the problems, I think, is that there weren't any specific NCAA rules providing clear notice that a situation like this, where there were individual failures to take appropriate action to prevent known or foreseeable criminal or tortious conduct that, that harms and endangers, that that could result in institutional liability. The NCAA historically had not disciplined for this type of um, conduct. Here's one example. Um, this involved the uh, UVA uh, lacrosse player. Her uh, boyfriend allegedly killed her. And apparently there was the lawsuit that's arisen out of this, and the claim is that the, it was foreseeable to the university that this guy might do this. Um, NCAA also is not historically disciplined for tortious conduct that results in injury. Uh, very tragic situation at Notre Dame where a student manager was set up in a lift during high winds. It falls over, he dies while filming uh, uh, football practice. That was found to be an OSHA violation, no action taken. Uh, another example at Colorado, uh, deliberate indifference of university's head football coach to sexual assaults of women during on-campus recruiting. No action there. Uh, on the antitrust issues, I don't really have time to go through. We can discuss them during questions. There has been a suit that's been filed um, by the governor of Pennsylvania on behalf of uh, the citizens, but we'll bring that up at the questioning stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists, our three panelists. Um, I'm sorry, as you know, between the earlier delay and the late delay getting started. We're a little uh, running in our panel, but we'll try our best. We've got three great panelists. First is going to speak is Brian Halloran, who is an attorney, and most importantly for our purposes today, served as a public member of the NCAA Division I Commission on Infractions. This work involved extensive knowledge of NCAA uh, rules, compliance, athletic department leadership and administration. As one of two appellate coordinators, Brian has been responsible for briefing and arguing all major infraction appeals before the NCAA Infractions Committee during his tenure there. Um, second, um, the second speaker, and she'll just begin after Brian's finished, um, Catherine um, Soluntic. Um, she is the Assistant Director of Enforcement for the NCAA. She currently works in the investigation and processing unit and serves as development liaison to Major League Baseball. Prior to joining the NCAA, she worked on campus for 10 years at the first the University of Nebraska, and Brian will like this, then the University of Colorado as athletic director in the uh, athletic academic advising. And finally, um, Britton uh, Banowski uh, is in his 11th year as the Commissioner of Conference USA, which is a 12 member, I think growing to 14 members, um, conference that's based primarily in Texas <laughs> and the southeastern part of the United States with many prominent university members. Um, he also serves as chair of the NCAA Committee uh, on Infractions, and in 2012, he founded the Heart of Dallas, which is a nonprofit organization using sports to inspire a philanthropy. I'll turn it over to the three of you in that order. Brian? Thank you. Um, I was looking today at my, uh, my little uh, name card, and it says uh, an NCAA perspective, and I think I've got to correct that just a little bit. I'm somebody that's got experience uh, with the NCAA process from my service on the Committee of 
infractions, but I wouldn't hold out to be giving the official NCAA pers perspective. I think we'll leave that to, to Catherine today. Uh, these are really just my own views um, based on my experience, and I think part of the purpose of having uh, public members on the NCAA Committee on Infractions is to have someone who really does have a truly different perspective, someone that's not uh, in the industry uh, and doesn't uh, have a, uh, you know, uh, doesn't have a horse in the race, doesn't draw a paycheck uh, in any way, shape, or form, or gains any kind of financial uh, benefit uh, from, from participating. And I think that's one of the, the things that was wise about um, you know, when the NCAA determined what the composition of the Committee on Infractions would be, was to include an outside and an outside perspective. So I'm here today. Um, I finished my service. I still uh, am involved, but uh, I, I'll speak from the heart and, and from my experience like I tried to do at every instance during uh, my service on the Committee of Infractions, and, and that was a valuable role. And it's probably the reason why I couldn't agree more uh, with, uh, with Matt. Um, because I'm going to add point number five to, to Matt's four points. And my fifth point would be uh, what that process would have added to the resolution of the Penn State case. Um, there would have been, uh, I think, a, a more apparent uh, fairness to the entire process because you would have had people who you know, weren't as intimately involved. And I think the public members on the Committee on Infractions would have provided that uh, outside perspective as well as the process itself. Uh, it would uh, have given the state of Pennsylvania, the citizens of Pennsylvania, the fans who weren't represented, uh, I mean, certainly not directly. I mean, they had the, um, the Board of Trustees who, you know, some of whom may have not been fully informed. But you would have gotten uh, not just a better process, I believe, uh, but a more apparently fair process. And then out of that, too, you would have gotten a report um, and a, uh, it would have been a thought-out report that would have been not at the, you know, at the barrel of a gun or whatever uh, a metaphor that, or cliche that you might use to describe how the, the, the result uh, ended up coming up about, uh, but you would have had a well-reasoned report. Uh, and it would have been available, I think, uh, as precedential value. I mean, you've got to wonder, what precedential value does this consent decree have? I mean, it's a one-off. So now it's just kind of out there and, and people in compliance at university campuses. You know, what can they draw from that? What can they learn? How can they use that consent decree uh, to guide their further behavior? Uh, and I think it's appropriate that Matt drew um, a reference to the Baylor case, which I think is the opposite. Now, uh, I was involved in the Baylor case. It was a horrible case. I mean, I think it occurred a little bit before uh, the internet had fully taken over our lives uh, so that we you know, couldn't get on and we couldn't blog. And, uh, but if you remember the circumstances of that case, you've got a young man who was murdered. And you could probably make the argument, but for the actions of Dave Bliss, the player that who was murdered might not have been on that campus because he was there uh, as a result of infractions uh, that allowed him to be there. He was a, 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 a sort of a, a 13th non-scholarship player. But the Baylor case, as, uh, as dire as it was, as serious as that case was, uh, was allowed to be investigated through the normal enforcement and investigation process, and then handled by the Committee on Infractions. Uh, we think a just result was given, very, very serious uh, penalties. I mean, if you talk to uh, anybody who was involved at Baylor at the time, uh, I think that they would say that the penalties that Baylor University suffered uh, were uh, you know, maybe not equivalent, but on the order uh, and within the range of the penalties that were suffered by, uh, by Penn State here. But I think the people in the Baylor community uh, felt better about that uh, because they'd had their process and they'd had their opportunity to be heard. Um, you know, Matt uh, says that uh, Gene Marsh said that this was a, uh, a cram down. Well, uh, it's interesting. Uh, that. Uh, I practice as a corporate bankruptcy lawyer for 15 years, and I think that calling it a cram down is underselling it, because when you get when you get crammed down, that's after a vote of the creditors, uh, and you get a hearing. You get a hearing before a federal bankruptcy court judge. Um, thank you. Uh, so <laughs> I, I really think that to, to say that that's a, a cram down is really. Uh, a, de-emphasizing uh, what's occurred there. Now, 
I, I think you know that maybe the committee on infractions would have come out with similar penalties. I mean, we all agree that it's an absolutely egregious situation. It's untenable to have a situation where the football coach becomes the uh, de facto chief executive officer of an institution. I mean, that's wrong. I mean, I think we all agree that the substantive behavior and the substantive penalties that were imposed uh, were probably, you know, the behavior was awful and the penalties are, are, may have gotten it right. But sometimes the process is just as important as the substantive uh, result. I mean, if we sit back and we think about it too, um, uh, Jerry Sandusky, uh, you know, the perpetrator of this most vile behavior, what did he get? He got a trial. He got a trial by his peers. And we provide that in American law. Uh, Penn State did not get that opportunity to be heard. Uh, and I think that we, you know, we lost something, and the public lost something by not being able to, even though the, the Committee on Infractions process itself is private, our reports are public, and the public lost by not being able to uh, be privy and, and to uh, have the opportunity to read that uh, Committee on Infractions report. So I think, you know, I think you've absolutely gotten it right, Matt, and uh, I, I could not agree with you more. Um, in the interest of giving my co-panelists uh, <laughs> an opportunity, and, and uh, Rod, I think your presentation was, uh, was very interesting. Uh, I'm, I feel uh, uh, woefully inadequate to address the subject of, of brain injuries, but I certainly think that it's a, a matter that's uh, worthy of, of the NCAA taking up. If a workable solution that works you know, across all the different campuses uh, and that can be um, certified as being medically necessary and appropriate could be uh, implemented. I, I, I certainly applaud that. And I think it's a it's a, a fascinating topic mm -hmm. and one that we're all uh, glad that you've taken up. Uh, I've got to say one one last thing, and I want to thank um, the Pepperdine uh, Law yeah. Review, uh, who, who've done a fabulous job hosting it. And I want to single out Michael Wood. I don't know if Michael's in the room right now, uh, but uh, uh, you know. My wife is Professor Weston, and so I've been you know, following uh, matters academic and, and law schools for a long time, and I've got to say that this is probably uh, the best run, student-driven uh, program that I, and best organized that I've, I've witnessed. So thank you very much, Michael. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll just echo those sentiments, and, and I would like to thank everyone here at Pepperdine. Um, when I went to see my supervisor to sort of run it up the flagpole to see if it was okay if I spoke at this event, I, I um, provided a list of all the speakers for the event, and I'm certainly uh, humbled to be uh, with this distinguished group, and my supervisor kind of looked at the, the list of speakers and kind of said, what are you doing with these people? So um, I, 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 again, thank you very much for having me here. I'll keep my comments very brief. Um, just listening to everyone today, there are three things that kind of struck me about some of our discussions today. And, and, and one of the issues is the health, is health and safety, and health and safety of our student athletes. And obviously, this is an incredibly important issue uh, for all of us at the NCAA. Um, quite frankly, I think student athletes are the best part of intercollegiate athletics. I think they are absolutely wonderful people and they work very, very hard. And so we have an obligation to, to um, help student athletes and, and make sure that, that they have, uh, that their health and safety is, is, um, is looked after. Uh, the NCAA has just announced that we've hired our first chief medical officer, which is something that we are very excited about at the NCAA. Uh, he has just started this week. Uh, we're, we're very excited about that. And in addition, the NCAA is, is working with uh, something called the Sports Science Institute. And the purpose of the Sports Science Institute is, is to collect data and collect information and collect um, research on injuries of all sorts, health and safety of all sorts. Uh, including brain injuries, and, and as was already noted, this is this is an important issue, uh, particularly today. I'd like to echo um, Professor McCann's um, uh, discussion earlier today when we were talking about mental health. One of the things when we're talking about the health and safety of our student athletes is that if you kind of did a straw poll and you went around and you asked student athletes and coaches what one of the biggest health and safety issues 
there is today, not only is it head injuries, but it's also mental health of our student athletes because they're under extraordinarily um, difficult time restraints, regiments, all of those type of things. So I think that's something to, to keep in focus with when we're talking about health and safety. Second of all is, is what does the membership expect the enforcement staff to police? And when I was on, I have, a, have a, the benefit of having been on campus, so I can kind of put my NCAA hat on and put my campus hat on, and so I see things a little differently sometimes. And when I was on campus, I remember they were, there was a series of academic reforms, and as was discussed, I had worked on campus in academic, athletic academic affairs. <coughs> I remember going into an administrator's office and just lambasting the NCAA and saying, how could they do this? And they don't understand what they're doing and all these new reforms. And this administrator leaned back in his chair and he said to me, Kathy, don't forget that the NCAA is us, uh, meaning the member institutions. So when it comes to enforcement and compliance and all of the things that we have been discussing today, it's the responsibility of the institution itself, the athletic department, the conference offices, and the NCAA. And so the question is, is, is what exactly do we want the enforcement staff to police? Obviously, we want them to police the bylaws. Um, and we want, historically, the enforcement staff has policed you know, bylaws 10 through 17 and, and some of the constitutional requirements. So it's things like recruiting and ethical conduct and playing in practice seasons. But beyond that, what is it that we want the enforcement staff to police? As was discussed a little bit here is the enforcement rules working enforcement working group, excuse me, and the rules working group has, has done massive reforms or is attempting to do reforms of the NCA manual. And the message that we've been given uh, as the national office is to look, we have to streamline the NCA manual. And the analogy that we have been given is, is we want to make the fairway wider but the rough deeper. And that's what we're looking to do. And so what role does, do these new changes have in terms of what the enforcement staff job is? And then the third thing I'll just mention briefly is how does the enforcement staff get information? So if, if there are rules that we are to police and that we are um, charged with enforcing, we have to have actionable information in order to, to do an investigation to look at those violations. And, and we receive information from all sorts of um, different areas. We receive information from the public. Uh, we have uh, people will call the public line and, and report a violation, and it can be everything from, you know, I was driving down the road and I heard, you know, so and so's talk radio show, and I really think you need to look into XYZ University for violations. And it, but it can be also student athletes calling in saying, you know what, my coach, he, he practices, he or she practices well beyond the, the time requirements that are under the, the NCAA accountable athletically related activities. So how would we get information in, in terms to enforce those rules? How would we have an actionable item? Is seeing a head injury on television, would that be enough for us to do a investigation? What would, look, what would that look like? And then, as was mentioned, the, the membership itself is going to have to, to implement some type of bylaw in order for us to be able to, um, to look into those rules. So those are all considerations to think about when uh, looking at enforcement's role in, in, in various aspects. So with that, I'll turn that over to my colleague. Thank you. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you, Maureen and uh, Michael, for putting this together. This has been a great day. And uh, thank you all for being here. Um, relative to Rod's um, uh, work, uh, I agree with most of uh, what he was suggesting. I, I think there is some data available, but it's not yet to the point where we have longitudinal studies that can uh, really tell us the, the nature and scope of the concussion area, the concussion issues. I mean, we know it, we have problems, and there's studies in place right now, but no one has really developed a, a broad range longitudinal study over 10 years or 15 years for us to base a a lot of conclusions on, but we do know that football is an inherently violent sport. I think it's obvious to all of us that the players are getting bigger and faster and stronger uh, every year. Uh, the quality of training is better, and the collisions then are more violent collisions, and the bodies just aren't prepared for those violent uh, collisions. And so it's an inherently dangerous sport. You can't really 
ignore that fact. Um, I've heard more people talk about issues related to informed consent. Uh, now that we know what you're getting into and you decide to do it anyway, um, do you take, have to take some responsibility um, for participating in a sport that is uh, so dangerous? Um, I think that's an important uh, issue that's just now starting to be discussed. Um, relative to what we can do, I think definitely we can do more on the safety side in terms of the rules. We do more and more of that all the time. Uh, we have rules um, that are implemented every year relative to um, kickoff returns or hits um, uh, in the helmet area. Um, we're ejecting this next year. You'll see that the that, that, um, players that, that actually target a, um, a defenseless player um, and make the hit will be, will be ejected from the game and they'll, they'll be suspended for a game. And they'll go to replay to decide whether they're suspended for a game, which will draw more attention to that and hopefully, you know, create a safer environment uh, for the defenseless players. And then um, relative to um, the other side, um, there are some studies that really suggest that, that uh, the brain function can be restored. Um, there's a group out of Dallas, actually, that I've, I've met with. Um, it's an organization called Brain Health. And what they're suggesting, and they've done a lot of work with uh, um, Folks who've been in the military that have come back from war and have post-traumatic stress disorder and concussion, that they can, they can actually retrain the brain and the frontal lobe of the brain to be more effective and more functioning. And so I think that's an, kind of an exciting thought that instead, you know, as, we, as we rehabilitate injuries, um, whether the physical injury, whatever, to be able to re rehabilitate a brain injury or to be able to put, you know, put someone back into a position where, where their brain functions better, I think is something uh, that's terrific. And then I do agree that you know, figuring out a way to maybe expand the catastrophic insurance um, for, uh, for student athletes um, that are severely hurt is something that, that we uh, obviously um, should look at. Relative to Penn State, I agree um, with virtually everything um, uh, Matt said and his abstract I think was, was spot on. I appreciate the need for the uh, NCAA um, leadership and presidents to exert leadership. I mean, that's important, um, but I think this was unprecedented and these were primarily crimes or, or actions that were certainly indictable. Uh, actions and so um, the jurisdiction in my opinion was questionable and I think we've taken the association to uh, to really some uncharted territory here and I'm you know not sure how it plays out going forward um, but we've kind of put ourselves in that place and uh, it'll be real interesting to see how the uh, the association either evolves uh, to a new standard of broad jurisdiction or or kind of gets more comfortable with its existing you know setup those are my thoughts First, I want to thank these wonderful panelists who are so, so good about keeping their time despite the inter inter interruption in the middle. Now, this, to me, is the most exciting part of the program. But it's up to you to make it exciting. And that is questions from you all. Um, and so I want to, um, I don't know if there are any questions prepared. If they're not, I'd like to open it to questions um, so we can get some questions from all of you with respect to the um, um, what was said this, uh, this afternoon. Um, I'll just start it while you're getting the questions or whatever. Um, Rod, you did begin before all of these people talked and were like a, were a self-repeating chorus that you agreed with what happened with Penn State and I wanted to know if you wanted to give you an opportunity to respond on that issue. Yeah, I, I'm also a, a constitutional lawyer. I care deeply about the deep due process issue. Uh, my good friend who's now deceased, Rex Lee, was involved in creating uh, some of that due process and some of those concerns. My primary point was that the NCAA, when they face a crisis, does have the capacity through its presidents to operate or, or to respond quickly. And I was using it as much for that purpose. I share the concerns with regard to due process. But I think in today's world where things go viral so fast, just ask Rutgers, that the president stepping in may have really helped the NCAA avert what would have been a far worse crisis. And, there, and I think now the schools are on notice. If you don't take care of your players or if you engage in something that's going to harm the integrity of the NCAA, we will act. I have a quote in my paper. I forget exactly. They put it. 
we're going to act. We're going to act quickly and firmly. And they did that. And it didn't cost Penn State that much. Um, reflecting that, just so I try to respond to what the audience is saying, um, fitting that comment, um, one person wrote a comment rather than a question. Um, and I'll just repeat it. It appeared as an outsider that the goal at Penn State was to put the situation behind them as soon as possible, including tearing down the Paterno statue so things became out of sight and out of mind. Future generations of students wouldn't have to bother with the issue. That's just a comment that seemed to reflect what you were saying so, somewhat. So uh, let me go on with a um, few other questions. Now this one um, is re reads, given the numerous recent scandals and the NCAA's limited investigative resources, how do we ensure compliance? Hmm. Some sub-questions here. Do we impose stiffer penalties? Will the football playoff generate more revenue to expand investigation and enforcement? And I suppose you could say the added money from the NCAA a basketball tournament conference. And that last one raises a question in my mind of how the bowl championship series, where that playoff money, I suppose, is generated, interacts with the NCAA in, as relate to investigative resources. So this question is open to everyone. And um, Kathy, why don't you start, and then we'll sure. let the others talk. There's been a lot of discussion about the football money, the 400 million or whatever it is, the BCS money. That's not our money. That is the Bull Championship Series money, which we have no affiliation with. Similar in the, in the circumstance, I can't tell Commissioner Banowski how to run his budget. We can't tell the BCS what to do with that money. And if you look at a pie graph of where, how the NCAA obtains revenue, Football is an itty bitty 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 sliver of that and that's coming from the FCS championship. So I think that's an important distinction to be made here is that $400 million we don't have access to. It's not our money. Um, so just to sort of clarify that point. Any other comments on this question? Let me just respond to that and I, I had to sweep over this. I think the creation of the BCS and the greed that it has brought with it and its focus on dollars has done enormous harm. That's why I suggested something be done with antitrust by a package coming forward. And it doesn't seem fair to me at all that we use primarily March Madness to fund everything, including the oversight of football, while all those $400 million are not used other than indirectly to benefit a student athlete or student welfare in the least. I, I, I probably should jump in because I serve on the BCS committee. <laughs> <laughs> and I served on the BCS television negotiating committee, so I understand a little bit about this. Um, the size of the pie is enormous in terms of revenue for college athletics. It comes from gate revenues, from, from football games that have 100,000 seats in it. A lot of money is being pumped into the system. Um, the money that comes into the BCS, about 99.9% .9 of it is to return directly to the universities for them to do what they want to do with it. Um, that's the mission. It's, it's really not taxed at all. The administrative overhead on the BCS money is zero. Um, all of the uh, commissioners that serve on the BCS also have input into the NCAA, though. And uh, we participate as, um, as members of the association. We are um, part of the governance of the association. Uh, we um, help approve the rules of the association. We help direct the activities of the association uh, through the staff and through our board of directors. Um, the funds derived from the men's basketball tournament primarily are the funds used to um, operate the organization, including operating uh, the enforcement arm of the association, which, by the way, has is, is been expanded. Um, in the last uh, 18 months, there's been a significant expansion of, of enforcement activities, really as a result of, of the perspective of presidents that said we need to, to take a little uh, stronger uh, role in the enforcement of rules. Can, can I respond? Sure. You know, I, I agree 100% with Rod that an antitrust exemption would be a good thing. I had proposed a couple years ago in an article an exemption from Section 1 only, and conditioned upon a number of things. One, most important, make sure student athletes get the benefit of their bargain. You know, and that's, to me, an opportunity uh, to complete their education, uh, compliance with Title IX, 
uh, you know, all the health, safety, and welfare benefits. You know, they ought to even, I wouldn't characterize student athletes as employees, but let's treat athletic injuries as, in effect, a cost of doing business. Nebraska has an administrative system that requires it, and so there is a way of doing this without characterizing them as employees. And I think that a uh, antitrust exemption would be so valuable to the NCAA if certain conditions were required, the money, they'd be more than happy to put in money. There'd be money coming in to enhance enforcement and do all of these um, other things. Um, I've got perspective on the uh, enforcement side of the question. And, um, you know, the size of the enforcement staff and the enforcement staff's budget has been increased. But um, the, the real issue, I think, for the enforcement staff is their tools. Um, there's some personnel issues there, but I think that the uh, quality of the enforcement staff has increased and will continue to increase. Uh, but the issue is, uh, uh, you know, other than the uh, pressure that can be put on people who are currently employed or still have uh, eligibility left, uh, you've got virtually no ability to compel uh, an outsider to cooperate. So it's a structural issue, and you could throw a ton of money at it. You could quadruple the size of the enforcement staff, and you'd probably be about in the same place that you are today. I mean, unless you've got congressional authority to give the NCAA, and you know, this is probably highly doubtful, uh, but to give the NCAA additional investigatory powers, you know, grant the, uh, the, uh, uh, the NCAA uh, right to subpoena, subpoena, I think you're going to be in the same place. And, you know, partly that's, a, I think, a soul-searching searching question for the NCAA. Who do we really want to be as a member-driven organization? Um, and, you know, maybe when the first uh, uh, penalty, you know, goes beyond the, the so-called death penalty and someone's membership is revoked because they've, you know, completely um, uh, abrogated their responsibilities to self police and, and self-enforce, you'll get that. But other than that, uh, I think we're kind of where we're at, and uh, I don't think that additional revenue and resources is going to change the enforcement landscape. Now, we've had a couple, changing the subject a little bit, we've had a, a couple questions, several questions actually, come in on, prodded by Rod's comment that they should shorten the uh, college football season. And <laughs> among them, let me just sort of throw them out, they wanted, uh, um, Britt's response to whether he thought what he thought about shortening the college football season and um, Rod to comment on how that might would that still help or might that hinder the ability it's a long question of the uh, of players um, to be prepared for the long pro season so you can you two can start and others can I'll, I'll just uh, jump in quickly I mean we expanded the season uh, to 12 games um, and then we allow you know we've allowed a conferences to have championship games on the back end of the 12th game and then we've uh, allowed bowl games uh, after that so the season has become really a 14 um, week season and at the same time we we uh, got now year-round training I mean it used to be that we had uh, you know student athletes given the summer off now they're expected to be training all the time and so uh, the wear and tear on student athletes are significant um, it's a year-round proposition i would argue that it extends down into, into youth sports as well our youth sports social culture is one where we train year-round we specialize um, if you want to be really good in a sport um, and your parents have the resources to to enable you to be good they put you into it all year round and so i think shortening the season i'm not opposed to that it takes money away that's the biggest, um, or the, no one likes to talk about it, but it, you know, it's one fewer home gate uh, for half the teams. Um, and we're adding a game, you know, we're adding a game. This, you know, this in 2014, we'll have, a, we'll have the playoff system in place, so there'll be four teams that will participate and there'll be an additional game added. So um, I, for one, think the season's too long. I think the wear and tear on the student athletes in football is extreme. I think the, you know, what he said about the CTEs, that, that's, that's real, and later in the season, the more collisions you have, uh, the, more, the more effect um, it has on your body from a degenerative standpoint. Good, yeah. uh, a couple of quick responses. I, one of the things I have in my paper is the possibility of going to 10 games. I, I really say there needs to be a study on this, but go to 10 games, shorten the season that way, but have a 16-team national championship, which would mean you'd, you'd have two teams play 14, four playing 13, eight playing 12, and 16 playing 11, but the net 
would be much better, and whether that revenue could make up for those games and therefore protect more players while at the same time providing some kind of a catastrophic and other kind of protection for the athletes. As to the NFL thing, I don't. The job of the NCAA is not to prepare those few players for the NFL. I care a lot more about what they're going to be like when they're 50 and they can't look at their grandchild and remember their name. If I, you know, there is an alternative to um, shortening the season. You could limit the amount of contact during practices. And I'll talk, you know, my perspectives come from I was on the NCAA's Competitive Safeguards Medical Aspects of Sport Committee for six years and chaired it for two. And I think, you know, I was just delighted to hear that there's a medical director that has just been hired. And the way the process works is we would make recommendations. I was the only lawyer on there, but it was some really outstanding doctors, athletic trainers, coaches, or whatever. And you know, all we did was make recommendations. We didn't have the authority to implement them. We worked with the various sports to monitor injury protection rates. I can tell you a lot of our recommendations, particularly in Division I, once they worked their way up the totem pole, economic factors would come into play and they wouldn't get implemented. So that's really gonna be the key to this is, you know, the NCAA was founded to protect student athlete health and welfare. And there's, you know, we can't compromise that because of the economics. There is plenty of money to go around to, you know, have the right level of enforcement, protect student athlete health and safety. But that's where there needs to be a balance drawn, not just on the uh, individual college campuses, but at the association level too. Could, could I say one thing just about Matt's comment very quickly, and that's that as a lawyer, the NCAA and others are not going to want that kind of evidence to come out, that these things would go up and they'd always get kicked back because of the commercial reasons. That's why the Arrington lawsuit or workers' compensation lawsuit or worse is going to happen to the NCAA if they don't respond in a more proactive way. It's coming. And as some of you know, this head injury issue is not, and concussion is not limited to just football. It's a growing issue in college soccer because soccer is moving more and more toward head, use of the head. And it's a repeated, medical evidence shows it's a repeated hitting um, that, that can have a real effect. So this should be, could be an issue with soccer as well. I know University of Michigan and some other schools are investing in a chip that, um, that can be put in a, um, in someone's um, <clears throat> mouth guard, where it can measure how much head hits have come, and that that can be accumulated, and so people can use it to know when it might be time to take it out. So there may be technological fixes that will help as well. Now, the ne next question um, is focused mostly on, the question goes to Kathy and, and Brian, um, and um, others can speak on it too. And uh, this person asked you, the two of you, to speak on what uh, is perceived to be the wide disparity of sanctions between infractions imposed um, on, um, in the NCAA um, on cases of similar nature. In particular, is there any discussion of standardizing sanctions? And of course, I would like you to expand that to say that is that an incorrect perception? Is, is there already a strong effort to try to standardize the sanctions? So if the two of you could speak on that issue, because I know there is a widespread belief that the sanctions are very uneven. Um, yeah, I'll speak to that. I mean, first of all, I'd have to say that the perception um, probably comes because, uh, I mean, there's a certain amount of uh, ignorance, and some of it's willful ignorance, that uh, people pay attention to the high-profile cases. Uh, and so uh, anyone who wanted to make a uh, thoughtful and reasoned analysis of the penalties that have been imposed in cases would need to look at all of the cases. Um, people tend to pay attention to just like the you know the way revenue is derived, men's basketball and football. But um, you know, as other panelists this morning uh, noted, people want to win across the spectrum, and they will compromise their value and integrity in order to win. So it is not just um, a uh, uh, you know inf infractions are not just the province of men's basketball and football. So. Uh, there are uh, infractions cases involving a multitude of sports. So you'd really have to look across that panoply of sports and look at all the cases. Um, you know, in a typical year, probably 15 to 20, uh, at least during the, my tenure on the committee, uh, major infractions cases were decided 
in case reports were issued. So I'd say, first of all, if you take a look at the, you know, at the facts and do a comprehensive study, I think you'd find that uh, the uh, penalties are uh, similar to the extent there is similar behavior. I mean, it's remarkable uh, the fact that they, you know, you can't just put these cases in categories. It is very, very, very difficult to do so. Now that being said, part of the, and, and maybe I'll let uh, Catherine uh, talk about this, uh, there is an attempt now to broaden the number of categories so that you've got, you know, tier one, two, tier two, tier three, tier four categories uh, so that, uh, to allow for the separation of, uh, you know, the significance of the um, behavior and therefore the significance of the penalty, you know, is more narrow so that there is a better delineation of the different kinds of cases. I mean, right now, um, there's, you know, up until the present time, there's just been major or secondary. So when you do that, you only have two categories. It's like, you know, mortal sin and venal sin. You, know, you, you, you don't have, there's going to be some gray area there when you only have two categories. Now, now that there's going to be four categories, I think you'll have a little bit more separation. So you can, you'll clearly be able to see the difference between a category one and a category four uh, uh, violation. Now, all that being said, too, you know, you have to look at the, uh, the composition of the committee on infractions, it changes over time. So people who decided a case in <coughs> 1999 are not going to be the same people who decide a case in 2008. So, you, you know, to a degree it reflects the difference in composition on the committee. And even though um, the uh, uh, cases, uh, the case reports have some precedential value, they don't have quite the same precedential value as a legal case. And so the Committee on Infractions does have the ability uh, to go outside um, you know, case precedent when the facts of the case before it uh, warrant that. So there will be some, some variation. And then, you know, it really comes down to um, who are you rooting for? Uh, and, and I think that will tell you, you know, you, of course, the, the most severe penalties happen to your school. <laughs> so I think there's an element of that, too. And I'll just briefly add, one of the great joys about working on the enforcement staff is that you are not involved in penalties. That penalties are the um, jurisdiction of the Committee on Infractions. We don't propose penalties, we don't make any recommendations on penalties, and so that's something that, um, uh, that we aren't involved in. And then just to piggyback on um, what Brian was said, I agree with everything that he said. The, the, the new enforcement rules working group, this division between level one, level two, three, and four, Level fours are going to be handled primarily at the conference level. Level four is going to be an, an incidental technical violation, and level one being the most serious and egregious. And in addition to this distinguishing between level one, two, three, and four, we're also going to have different, proce uh, different processes by which you can process a case. So a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion about the time it takes to have something go through the Committee on Infractions. We will have um, different me methods to, to send it to the Committee on Infractions. We will have a written record only process where we send documents to the Committee on Infractions and they make the decision. We'll have something called a rocket docket where everyone agrees that, you know, here, here are the violations and we're going to send it to the Committee on Infractions and we're going to have an expedited hearing of some sort. So there's going to be different, not only different levels, different methods of processing a case. Thank you. Now, um, I know you've seen a lot of questions come up here, but most of the rest actually I can sort of bunch together into one sort of big question. Um, because a lot of you must be concerned about this issue, and I think everyone may want to speak about it. Um, and that is, what about these penalties? Don't they hit the wrong person? And again, these are four different questions I'm trying to piece together, but well, aren't you hurting current students by penalizing past behavior? Aren't you penalizing, or aren't you penalizing the institution and the community and the, and the fans for something that was done by one player or their agent? Um, or how do you factor in how responsible the community at Penn State was for letting that activity go on? So the point is, I think you understand sort of the thrust. They're, they're long questions, and I've just summarized them. But um, I, I, many of you have the concern that current players who have nothing to do with it are being punished by not going to bowl games or whatever for what happened in the past. Um, comments on that general issue? I've heard you speak on this one before. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm generally uh, ready to answer about any, any question, whether it's the right or the wrong answer. Um, and this makes me think of uh, a little bit what uh, Dave Roberts said uh, this morning about um, he'd like to see a safe harbor out there so if a university can prove that they did everything that they reasonably could have done to avoid a, uh, uh, an infraction, that they basically get a, a free pass. And I mean, to a degree, I think that it's important that there's some predictability and that institutions um, you know, have some aspects of a safe harbor. But the bottom line is, is that um, no one has suggested a uh, really an alternative uh, to the current system because ultimately institutions only act through their employees. I mean, I haven't seen you know a building on a campus commit an infraction. Uh, an infraction occurs through the actions of a university's employee, employees, and the university hires and trains those people. So. You know, ultimately, you've got to hold the institution responsible, and people are free to come and go. And frequently, what happens is, is that the people who are involved in infraction get fired, so they're punished. Uh, but now, you've got the institution who hired those people has to suffer some consequences. Uh, otherwise, you know, if there are no consequences uh, to an uh, infraction, it becomes meaningless. Um, and institutions have chosen to, you know, group together and act democratically and to have this set of rules and, 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 and punishment. So, you know, we as a committee uh, strive very hard to try and craft penalties in an individual case that avoid to the greatest degree possible uh, consequences on the innocent. But it's just not possible to be able to do that. Now, one thing that is going to be part of the new rules reform um, is to have greater financial pen penalties on the institution. And you know, that is, a, I think, a penalty that probably does not affect the, you know, the, the future student athletes as much. I mean, it's gonna have some impact because when the budgets are constrained, then there's less resources available um, to, to provide the experience to those student athletes. But I think that is probably a better penalty when you wanna hit the institution and you uh, uh, are seeking to avoid uh, consequences on innocent student athletes and other you know, innocent um, participants in the process. So I, I think that's the best answer. Uh, the NCAA and the Committee on Infractions is fully aware of that issue. It's one of the things that bothers us. You know, personally, I think more than any other thing is when we have to impose a penalty, particularly um, postseason bans, where you know that that's gonna hurt student athletes that had nothing to do with it. Uh, it's very troubling, but you've got to have serious penalties to combat serious violations. Well, and sometimes you have um, cases where uh, universities, because of their intentional uh, misconduct and their intentional violations, got great competitive advantage, got great recruiting advantage, and they parlayed that com recruiting advantage and that competitive advantage into, into bowl games, into conference championships, into national championships. Um, because of it, and and uh, and sometimes with with culpability that goes all the way up um, up the chain of command. And so, if you don't actually address the university's responsibility, it's hard to do because you don't want to, you know, obviously punish the university when there's student athletes that get affected by it. Then you really have no opportunity to to make an impact. Let, let, let me just say one real quick because I agree with what's been said, particularly Brian's comment. As I sat on the infractions appeals committee. We were deeply concerned about the impact on student athletes. It gets back to a point Catherine made too. You, you, you've got, you have authority. You have authority to do certain things. You have limitations, and that's one of the things we're really arguing for is that the NCAA needs to give more authority to I I enforcement. But I think Brian's right. We need to have more penalty, more dollars, more penalties, fines, and. Uh, I remember in one or two cases I was involved in, and I've been a college president, I kept saying, I can't wait till we get the college president because they're letting this situation go on. They have the power to do something about it. They should be penalized, not the student athlete. 
Well, we just about run out of time, and um, there are a few questions remaining. We won't be able to ask them, but I would like to get the, so you hear the issues that people were still concerned about as I'm wrapping up. One, one person did want to mention that Ibra added soccer to the concussion problem list, and brought, one student properly, or one of you properly noted about the issue of women's lacrosse and how the NCAA has banned the use of helmets in women's lacrosse, and I think that is worthy of note. Also, other people ask about what's the role of the states, such as California with the State uh, Athletes Bill of Rights, in getting involved, how will that affect the NCAA and how can they do it? How about the lawsuits, the possible lawsuits on concussion injuries? Will that effectively uh, be a death knell to college football? Just as the, uh, the lawsuits, as somebody else mentions, involving Penn State, how much will those lawsuits end up, those lawsuits against Penn State, be an effective uh, uh, penalty on all of that? And how the, as for getting the issues out, how much the criminal system. So how much there are other mechanisms other than the NCAA that are interacting with the NCAA. Those are the comments that people wanted to add. I think they were good comments. And I thank all of you for making this panel a success. I want to help you join me in thanking these five people. <laughs>